Normally for this type of video, which has some pretty heavy content, I would use my more technical and formal format, which is just the text on the screen and then a voiceover to show you text by text, lead you text by text through the argument that I'm making. I chose not to do that for this video because I wanted it to be a more informal, conversational, personal style because the things that I'm talking about in this video are things that actually bother Muslims. I know this because I talk to them about it, and I know this because I view YouTube comments on videos that talk about the things I'm going to talk about in this video, and I read their comments on Islamic Q&A forums online and so forth. These are things that keep some Muslims up at night. Things like the bridge over hell. I talked about this in a previous video, um, and you can reference that if you want for a text-by-text walkthrough of the doctrine of the bridge over hell. It begins in Surat Maryam in the Quran and then weaves through the Sahih, and I lay each one of these out for you. I'm just going to give you the overview again and then build on it, and I'm going to do all of this in order to critique the theology of Islam and the forgiveness and mercy and love of Allah. So, the bridge over hell. You're a good Muslim, you do what Muslims are supposed to do, and you die. You will have to cross the bridge over hell. And when I say over hell, it is through the flames of hell. Some Muslims will be burnt so badly that only the marks of prostration will be left intact, which is how they'll be identified. And so, Muhammad has to cross the bridge too. Now, he crosses very quickly. And then Muslims after him cross at proportionally lower and lower, slower and slower speeds, getting burned um, more and more severely along the way. And then after you do this, by the way, which is a means of purification for sin, then you will, in an astonishing hadith that I read in Sahih al-Bakari probably ten times before I, I, I took it in, and then I immediately go to the uh, commentaries, on the Hadith, and they say the exact same thing. So, after you cross over the bridge, through the flames of hell, and you are burned, according to the sins that you've committed in this life, as a Muslim, you will um, be stopped at an arched bridge. And again, this is Bukhari 2440. Oh, and by the way, this is narrated by, by uh, Abu Sayyid al-Qudri. Okay, so this is not just anybody. So, Sahih al-Bukhari 2440 says... They will be stopped at an arched bridge in between hell and paradise, where they will retaliate upon each other for the injustices done among them in the world. And when they get purified of all their sins, they will be admitted into paradise. So after you cross the bridge through the flames of hell, you will be stopped on another bridge, and you will retaliate upon other people for sins committed in this life. And when you are purified of your sins, then you will be admitted into paradise. Where is the forgiveness of Allah? Does Allah forgive your sins? You pass through the flames of hell for them, and you retaliate upon yourselves for your sins. That's what purifies you. You aren't forgiven. Allah doesn't forgive your sins. And what an act of mercy to make the Ummah pass through the flames of hell. Okay, so that's just a really high-level review of the bridge over hell. But there's something else, okay? There's something else called punishment in the grave. And even on an Islam Q&A forum, which I'll put the link up for you if you want to visit it, there's a sheikh there who reviews all of the things that will get you punished in the grave, and he concludes, as many things in Islamic theology are very inclusive, he concludes that just about everyone is going to be punished in the grave. So Muhammad found out about this because a Jewess was talking to Aisha, and she says to Aisha, Do you know that you'll be punished in the grave? And Muhammad overhears it, and he says, the Jews will be punished in the grave. And then Muhammad goes away for a couple of days, and then he comes back to Aisha and says, do you know that you'll be punished in the grave? So 
the Jewess apparently informs Muhammad that he'll be punished in the grave. At which point, Muhammad, after a couple days of thinking about it, confirms it. And he got a revelation from Allah, according to some of the other narrations. And then Aisha adds in Sahih al-Bukhari, I never saw him but seeking refuge from punishment in the grave after that. Muhammad was so bothered by this that every time he offered Salat from that point on, he prayed that Allah would spare him from the punishment in the grave, which is so severe, by the way, that the animals can hear it. Anything can hear it except for humans and jinn. How convenient. Another unfalsifiable statement by Muhammad. The punishment in the grave is so severe that the animals can hear it, but humans can't. And what does the punishment in the grave look like? Well, it depends. Muhammad saw a man who stole a cloak from the spoils of war. And Muhammad saw him in the grave with the cloak wrapped around him, but it was a cloak of fire. That was his punishment in the grave. For another man, it was like an iron hammer between his eyes, striking him. This is what Muhammad was afraid of. This is what modern Muslims who know about this stuff are afraid of. You're afraid because Allah's forgiveness and mercy are not there to help you. You die as a Muslim and you get punished in the grave. Maybe it's a fiery cloak. Maybe it's a hammer between your eyes. Whatever it is, it will be so severe that the animals will hear your torment. And that punishment does nothing for you. It does nothing to expiate your sins or purify your sins. You still have to cross Asarat. You still have to walk the razor-thin bridge through the flames of hell for the purification of your sins, which are not forgiven. And you still have to retaliate on other Muslims at the second bridge before you enter paradise. So Allah will punish you in the grave. Allah is forgiving and merciful. Allah will make you pass over the fiery bridge through the flames of hell. Allah is forgiving and merciful. And Allah will make you retaliate upon others for sins committed in this life before you are pure enough to enter paradise. Allah is forgiving and merciful. Give me a break. Muhammad was a horrible theologian. This is not theology. This is atrocious. What about Allah's love? You know, I read my first manual of Islamic jurisprudence. This is the Shufihi manual. And I read this manual after I had conducted a systematized study of Sahih al-Bakari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan Abu Dawood, and read most of Sunan Anasai, Sunan Ibn Majah, Jami al -Turmidi. And when I read Sharia, all of that atrocious stuff in the Hadith, it's right here. When I was reading this manual, all thousand pages of it or so, I kept thinking, I've read this before. It's just the Quran and the Hadith codified into a legal format. And there's an excursus on theology in this book. And it talks about the, the oneness of Allah, the transcendence of Allah, the hearing sight of Allah, the speech of Allah, the virtue of His entity, and on and on it goes. You know what it does not talk about? It does not talk about the love of Allah. Look it up in the back. It's mentioned once. One time the love of Allah is mentioned. And even then it's conditional. This was not surprising because I had read the Hadith and I had realized by the time I got to that point that it's just the Hadith codified. So I don't expect to find anything about the love of Allah in the codified book of Sharia because I don't see anything about it in the Hadith collections. 
What about the Quran? 28 times. The love of Allah is mentioned in the Quran 28 times by my count. 22 times it's in the negative. Allah does not love. And six times it's conditional. If you do something to earn it, Allah will love you. Allah is not forgiving and not merciful because he requires you to be tortured in the grave, be burned to a crisp as you cross a bridge, hoping you do cross it. Maybe the hooks pull you off of it. At the very least, the hooks grab out chunks of your flesh. And then you retaliate upon other Muslims. Allah is not forgiving and merciful. And he is not loving. Show me in the Quran where love is an essential attribute of Allah. You cannot do it. And if you want to respond to this video as a Muslim and say that Allah is forgiving and merciful, it says it over and over in the Quran, don't, don't waste your time. Don't waste my time. I know exactly what the Quran says. I want you to define for me exactly what the mercy and forgiveness of Allah is. What does it actually cash out to be? How is any substantial concept of mercy and forgiveness compatible with torture in the grave and with crossing a fiery bridge through the flames of hell and retaliating upon other Muslims and other people for sins committed in this life? How is that compatible with any sort of rational theology? So how does this compare with Christian theology? To understand Christian theology on these topics, as with most things in the New Testament, you have to go to the Old Testament. So what is the Old Testament? What does the Old Testament have to say about this whole atonement thing and the crucifixion and the resurrection? It starts in Genesis. All right, here's, here's the picture that Christian theology gives, and you compare it to the picture that Islamic theology gives you and see which one makes more sense. See which one is more adequate. In Genesis, God formed man out of the dust of the earth. This is not a scientific statement. Dust in the ancient world was associated with death, with mortality, with the underworld. Okay? God made men out of mortal stuff. You will die. That's the bad news. What's the good news? But God breathed into him the breath of life. Man is mortal. God is immortal. And God placed Adam and Eve as archetypes for humanity in the garden. What was in the garden? The tree of life. What's the tree of life? Revelation 2. To him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I will grant him victory, and he will eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The tree of life is a metaphor for the paradise, for the life-giving presence of God. And God took mortal Adam and Eve, and he put them in his life-giving presence. The bad news is you're mortal. The good news is you are in the eternal life-giving presence of God. But then came sin, rebellion against God's law, and Adam and Eve, again as archetypes for humanity, were expelled. What followed? Death. Their fate was sealed. Death had begun, and there was a cherubim with a flaming sword guarding the path of reentry. I think of that as a metaphor, saying, you will not get back into the presence of God on your own terms. The problem of sin before a holy God is a supernatural problem, and it requires a supernatural solution. So, at the high-level view, the problem with humanity is death and sin. Somehow, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, says that death and sin have been conquered. How is it that death and sin were conquered? The death and and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus, in his death as a human, tasted death for every 
man. And with respect to the sin problem, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. The death problem was taken care of by Jesus Christ. The sin problem was taken care of by Jesus Christ. And Paul says, death and sin are done. All you have to do is apply the salvific work of Jesus Christ to yourself. And then what? Divine forgiveness. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's true forgiveness. You are not punished in the grave. Do not pass through the flames of hell. You do not retaliate upon each other for sins committed in this life. Your sins before the judge of the world have been taken care of. They were imputed to Christ. So there's forgiveness. What about mercy? This is all an act of mercy. A voluntary choice by God to save us from our own self-created problems of sin and death. Problems that we all choose to be a part of. And what about love? The entire thing was motivated by divine love. God is love. That's what the text says. What does it actually mean? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This whole thing was motivated by the love of God. What kind of love in John 3.16? Agape sin is the gr grammatical form. Agape, that's the type of love, the strongest type of love that can be described in Koine Greek is used in John 3.16 to describe the love that God has for his creation. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, then he lay down his life for his friends. But Jesus didn't only lay down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for his enemies, for the very soldiers who crucified him, for the people mocking him from the bottom of the cross. Jesus laid down his life for everyone. Christian theology makes sense about the human condition. And it makes sense about the divine attributes that God should have as the supreme being. In Christian theology, God is supremely loving. He is supremely merciful. He is supremely forgiving. And if you are a Muslim watching this, I know what you want to think. You want to think Allah is forgiving and merciful. Fine. Because that's, that's what the Quran says. Okay. Next time you're praying your salat... I want you to actually think, is Allah forgiving and merciful? Next time you're lying in bed at night, wondering what it will be like to be tortured in the grave and cross over the fiery bridge through hell, I want you to ask yourself, when those things are actually occurring, as you believe they will, will you be able to, proc to proclaim the mercy, and forgiveness, and love of Allah? I suggest that you will not. These things only make sense in Christian theology, where God, the God of Christian theology, is the paradigm of moral virtue, the paradigm of love, paradigm of forgiveness, and the paradigm of mercy. And I would encourage you to consider what Christian theology has to say about the human condition. And I would encourage you to consider a God who is actually loving and actually forgiving and actually merciful. Thanks for watching.